everywhere and there's, there are boats everywhere and uh, I think they thought I went in with the airplane. But John, are these like fishing boats or fishing boats, boats, bigger or? boats, junks? Because where I ended up was in a major shipping lane between China <laughs> and North Vietnam. Mm. So all the islands in the shipping channel were defended islands. Mm. Any aircraft guns mm. and automatic weapons and all that stuff. You were not feeling really good yet then. Well, I'm just, I'm just hoping that somebody comes and gets yeah. it at this point. Um, and I have no idea how much time passed. And, and then I heard some gunfire going off. And the next thing I know is a Navy A-1 flies right over the top of me. So I get my radio out and I call them and I tell them, you know, turn around and come back. I'm down here in the water and, and there's a two-masted junk about maybe a quarter mile away from me. Um, I said, and I said, I, there's a guy in the bow and I think he's shooting at me. <laughs> and, uh, and so the, the Navy guy says, well, I don't see you, but I see the junk. So he, he rolled in in his A-1 and he fired those great big uh, five inch rockets they carried, Zuni rockets. And, and the boat just, just disappeared. It was spectacular. Man, there was crap flying everywhere. Well, all the other little boats then, they turned around and parked. They got out of the way. <laughs> so what I didn't know at that point, uh, prior to that guy getting to me, they actually didn't have maps of the area. Because nobody goes down 20 miles south of China. I mean, right. nobody flies way up there. Uh, huh. I thought I was near Haiphong. I was way north of High Farm. Um, so here we go. So the, I got the Navy A-1 guy. What I didn't know was they tried to get an Air Force flying boat into me, an SA-16, and uh, he had gotten shot up, uh, lost an engine, and had a guy wounded on the flying boat, so he had to leave. So the entire rescue force now, uh, late in the day, is one Navy helicopter, and two Navy A-1s, and that's it. There's nobody else up there. Hmm. So I'm, I'm talking to the, the A-1 guy. I can talk to him, and I, said, I told him, I said, every time you fly out over those islands over there, they're shooting it. I, there's a lot of gun, a lot of shooting going on. He says, well, he, he called back and he says, well, I don't know if you've noticed those geysers in the water from time to time around you. I go, uh, yeah, I see them. He says, well, they're using you for mortar practice. He said, they're lobbing mortar rounds at you from the beaches. Right. So, so he said, the, the, the helicopter's on the way. And so I'm just looking at this one only A1 over me. And the next thing I hear is another A1 comes in, and they start working some of the beaches over, and then this helicopter flies right over the top of me and goes into a hover, and I go, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, so they drop the hoist, and I, I, get, it, I get in the, the horse collar is what they use to pick you up. Well, by now, I'm, I'm exhausted. And uh, he starts to go, and I fall out of the horse collar. Mm -hmm. So now he's got to circle around and set up again. And now when he goes in, he, into a hover, the rotor wash is taking and blowing me down underneath the helicopter. And so um, they were actually getting ready to put a guy in the water to help me out. I managed to get in there, and then the hoist shorts out in the helicopter. <laughs> so now I'm about 100 feet below the helicopter in my thing, and it's time to leave. These guys have had about all the fun they can stand. And in fact, during the about 35 or 40 minutes they were under fire continuously, coming in to get me and go out, they expended over 3,000 rounds of ammo off the two guns in the helicopter. Mm -hmm. So here we go, <coughs> the, the helicopter's moving around, the A1s are rolling in and strafing, and I'm swinging wildly underneath this helicopter, saying, just let's go, go, go. Well, they finally got the winch going and got me up into the chopper. Now the chopper's got a problem with me because I want to hug everybody. So I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to ricochet around the copper. Well, for a second, he let me just shoot a gun out the window just to settle me down. And then they actually, they actually strapped me to the floor because they didn't want me falling out because the helicopter's 
doing some pretty wild evasive maneuvers on our way out through all these islands. The guys were shooting out the windows, but he did have time to come back with a bottle of whiskey for me. A little, a little, a little airline bottle of whiskey. So. But, and believe it or not, they all carried this stuff. My first time they had whiskey on board that helicopter, too. You may have mentioned it. I'm saying, what kind of helicopter was it? It's a, a CH3. Mm -hmm. the ones with the, CH55? No, CH3. Older the version. The older one. The, big one. It's the big, not as big as a 53. Hmm? Is that the one that on top of the one that can float? It's the one that can float. float. Is that what they call a sea uh, uh, king? Sea king. Sea yeah. king. Yeah. In fact, if you go to San Diego, there's one on the deck of, the, I think it's the Hornet down there? Midway. Or the Midway? Midway yeah. Yeah, there's, there's one of those there. That's painted in the squadron colors of the guy who picked me up. Which I didn't know until I went to, we did the deal at San Diego. So, we finally clear all the islands. And now they can calm me down, and I'm calmed down a little bit. Um, the, and the, the A1s have to head back to their carrier, because it's, it's starting to get dark outside. And they said, well, we're going to drop you off on a destroyer. We've got to get gas. I said, well, that's nice. He said, we're going to drop you off on a destroyer, get gas, and go. And I said, okay. So I figured they land on a destroyer <laughs> on the aft deck and let me out of the helicopter. No, that. That's not the way this works. <laughs> and I'm going, oh great, I'm going to be stuck on a destroyer. I'll never get off of that thing. They said, no, we've got new plans. We're going to take you back to the carrier constellation. I said, but we still got to get gas. So there's a destroyer. Here comes this guy in his helicopter. And he goes into a hover just above the deck. He doesn't land. He's sitting there. And they pass up a fueling hose and they plug it into the floor. There's like no breakaways or anything on this setup. It's the, it's the damnedest thing I'd ever seen. You've done that? Yeah, well, Hyper. yeah, the hyper. Yeah. So, so then they slide off to the side and they go down below the deck to get, Gravity to get, better, to get better fuel pressure, yeah. a bigger head pressure. I'm going, I'm doomed. These guys are insane. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go back in again. I'm going. <laughs> It was, it was Helicopter Squadron 6, the, the raunchy Redskins, of which I am now an honorary member, I might add. <laughs> so we get, we get done with that, and off we go in the helicopter. And uh, by now, I, I am pretty tired. And they said, well, we're going to land on the Constellation like you off. And anybody who's been on a Navy ship, no, they don't let anybody wander around on a carrier unless you got your little hard hat on, I guess. And, Somebody's got to escort you. So they land, a guy comes up to grab me from the helicopter, and about then, the lights go up on the bridge, the superstructure there, and there's a band playing, playing the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe it. It's, this is surreal at this point. And then, uh, and then uh, out of the darkness comes this guy, and he goes, welcome back to the state, son. My name is Sharp. It was four-star Admiral Sharp, who just happened to be visiting. So, for three days after that, I was his Air Force showpiece as we went from ship to ship. <laughs> he dragged me along with him. A small for here. Okay, but, he said, <laughs> but he said, what do you well, want? I said, I'd like a beer. Like, huh? You probably got some table scraps oh, and things. Those guys yeah. eat pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he eats well. But um, he said, what do you want? I said, well, I, sir, I'd like to. I'm tired. I said, if I could just get a beer and a hamburger, that'd be great. So they take me to a, a private room, I guess. They said it was in a quiet area. It was the noisiest damn place I've ever been in my entire life. <laughs> and pretty soon there's a knock on the door, and it's this little Filipino guy with a change of clothes for me, and because he wants my flight suit and my gun and all that. And he's got a hamburger and a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so the next morning, he brought my flight suit back. It's all cleaned and washed and that. My gun's all cleaned up. I have no ID at that time. All we carried was a Geneva Convention card. No name tags, no nothing uh, when we went and flew. Really? Yeah. So we go from carrier to carrier and finally I told the Admiral, I said, sir, I got to get, I want to get back to my unit over in Thailand. So he said, oh, we'll get you there. We'll set it up. So they put me in one of those cods and they catapulted me off to the S2, name. Yeah. yeah, the S2 or whatever it was. Yeah, 
So off we go to Da Nang. I land at Da Nang. Now, here, here I am at Da Nang. My base is in Thailand. And I got to get from Da Nang to Thailand somehow. I have no ID. I have no orders. It's just me. So I go into the base operation and you'll like this. And I say, uh, I need to get back to Karat. I need to get to Karat, Thailand. The guy says, well, where are your orders? I said, I don't have any. He says, where's your ID cards? I don't have any. I said, I just got shot down three days ago. And the Navy dropped me off. What I didn't know was the Navy had called the Wing King. Sharp had called the, the Wing King. And the word never got down on my exact arrival time to take care of me. So now I'm getting, I'm getting upset, pissed off. So I touched my gun, which is over here. Now all hell breaks loose. <laughs> now, now nobody's happy with me. <laughs> so I, I finally, I told the guy, I said, let me talk to your wing commander. I said, I, I, he can ask his intel people who I am. So I call him and he said, oh, wait a minute. He says, give me that guy at base operations. And then all I heard was, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. Hold that C-130 at the end of the runway. Yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. <clears throat> And so they turned the C-130 around, came back, got me, and took me back to my base. So that was my last combat tour. Uh, for that, yeah, there was two ways to, to, to go home in 66. Yeah. Well, three ways. You could fly, yeah. you could fly for a year, uh, you could fly 100 missions in North Vietnam, or you could get shot down twice, which is the short route back. So I, took, I took the short route back. And... Uh, and so that's, that's kind of what happened from a survivor's point of view. And it was really interesting getting with the Navy guys, so at this symposium uh, and learning what had really gone on, where I really was. And uh, they, the helicopter guys actually took a vote on whether to go in and get me or not because it was such a highly defended area, mm -hmm. which I, of course, had no clue about. So. Uh, you know, I owe everything to them, and in fact, this last summer, I went to the, the, uh, the co-pilot of the helicopter lives in, Billing, lives in Billings, Montana. I went out and spent a week with him, uh, talking to his grandkids about oh. what a hero this guy was. Mm -hmm. so, so, see, the services really do work together. The <laughs> Navy and the Air Force can work together. And, uh, so you fly in helicopters every chance you get now? No. <laughs> no. Um, so after that, then they sent me. I I went back to the states and I was a T thirty eight instructor in Enid, Oklahoma, for about two years and maybe three months. And by then, uh, Air Training Command had had enough of me. I'd had enough of Air Training Command, so I went back to the one hundred five and went back for another tour. At which I did not jump out of another airplane over there, although I tried. Uh, one short thing, I had a gun blow up on me in Laos. We were scraping oil barrels in a river. It seemed like a good thing to do. And when the gun blew up, it blew about a three by five uh, door off the side of the airplane and blew the solid metal breech right off the side of the airplane. I thought I'd been hit. Um, <coughs> And so I, when that happened, I cleaned the airplane off, lit the burner, and started climbing. Well, when I tried to come out of afterburn, the airplane would compress her stall so badly, I could hardly read the instrument panel. So I pointed her for Thailand and just left her in burn mm -hmm. and said, I'll get to where I want to go. And I, ac I actually ended up uh, with that airplane trying to, trying to get it down to land. I must have changed the runway about three times over this base I was at in uh, the Khan Phnom, if anybody knows where that is. Um, you I finally they changed the runways? or you? I just, changed you my just, landing you runway. You were I'm circling do down, right, trying right. to get slowed down. I mean, kind of like min afterburner. Got my big speed brakes up, pulling mm. about seven Gs, trying to slow the airplane down. Mm. I finally said, this, this isn't going to work. So I just reached up and I turned the fuel off. And so I ended up, I ended up dead sticking that 105 on the runway. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was close. Wow. Um, but that was my only other close call. So, so I had a question back to you were talking about how you wound up so far north, and did, did you ever kind of come up with how you wound up there? Was after birth or so? Um, 
I think I started out further north than I really was, or thought I was, and I think instead of heading straight east, I probably headed northeast. Okay. Because I was pretty far north. Mm -hmm. Can turn that on? John, what was that corridor? I, I've, I've read numerous accounts about it uh, going up toward Hanoi. There was a, a corridor there that was infamous for its defenses, and um, this was in the early part of the war. They, they were flying F-100s a lot up through there, and uh, a lot of casualties, a lot of casualties. Well, you had the Red River Valley, which was the, the Red River ran through Hanoi, and so that's why there's an organization called the Red River Fighter Pilots Association. You had to fly over Hanoi once to be a member. Now, now they let any fighter pilot or any pilot who's flown combat join it. But back then, that was it. Go ahead. I like those naval aviator wings you had up there. You like that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's me. That's when I was the uh, young guy. And in fact, my, at that squadron, we have a reunion uh, one Saturday a year outside of Fredericksburg, Texas. And uh, I, I got that. It was middle of October. Is that in country or Texas? Or this this yeah. is in Thailand. Okay. This is, I'm 23 years old with my mighty 105. There's a picture of it, just for those who didn't know what it looked like. What the panel blew off from the yeah, machine? Yeah. It's this panel right here. Okay. The one with all the slots in it. Right beside you. Yeah, you can see the gun shoots right up yeah. through there. Yeah. It's a big airplane. airplane. Oh, it's a huge airplane. Um, you can walk underneath the wing. With, when it's on the ground, you can walk right under the wing. Um, single engine, too. Single engine, single seat. We had the two-seaters, too. The, the weasels were the two-seaters. John, did you ever fly the weasel? I've flown the airplane, but I've not. The only weasel mission I ever flew was in a single-seater sitting on the weasel's wing with uh, uh, anti-radar missiles. And, you know, he does this stuff working the signal from the site, and you're going up with him, and then you shoot these missiles on his call, and then everybody light the burners and roll over and dive in after the smoke trails looking for the SAM site. Hmm. This is a great way to get shot down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a really pretty airplane, and it was really uh, easy to fly. I was surprised. Um, Takeoff speed was about 195 knots, and uh, we flew final at about 195 oh, okay. basic weights. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's all engine. I was going to say, it's got its own category, like with Class E, category Cat E. Really yeah, nice. <laughs> as a matter of fact, it did, and uh, Cat X. There's, no fuel, there's no fuel in the wings. The wings are so thin, there's no fuel in them. All the fuel was... Uh, in, in the fuselage, and there's a big Bombay on the bottom of it because it was designed to carry a big nuke weapon, and there's a 2,000 pound piston in there that would push the nuke free at supersonic speed so you can mm. deliver a nuke going supersonic. Holy cow. We put a big fuel tank in there. You said the engine was a turbojet. It was not a fan, it was just pure. No, not, not in the 60s. Pure straight through. Yeah. <coughs> so, how much, you know, how much like? Uh, it was um, about 17,000 pounds of thrust uh, in mill, about 22,000 22, in burner. Mm -hmm. And for takeoff, we used water injection. So it would give you another 2,500 pounds of thrust. Wow. And you only tried to go once without water on takeoff. <laughs> with a full bomb load on because it would eat up all the runway plus a lot. You went to the water runway, did you get in Cool. Uh, we flew off an 8,000 foot strip, and that guaranteed you'd be just about in the overrun when you'd rotate. Quite a roll. Yeah, oh yeah, Republic built it. This is Thailand's over here, Karat's down in here, obviously Hanoi. Uh, I ended up way up in here somewhere. Or wow. up in here. Where's it's the DMZ there? Right here. Okay. That red line. Yeah. Okay, in fact, that's, that's where that I shot. Area. I was shot down right here the first time. Okay, I was just south here. I was in Quantry and mm -hmm. 
This just shows some of the, uh, the rescue uh, stations for the Navy that have ships or helicopters. The helicopters will go out and park on the, on the back of cruisers and wait. So that's